Yeah. Yeah. Right on the screen. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, this is us. Correct. It's creating traffic on campus, right? Yeah. It's a lonely walk. Where are you going to be? We're the lonely walk. We get in this path here when you walk in and out of the library, so I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Let's stop. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> cute. Oh, I didn't make it. Yes, you made it. Hey, yeah, hi. Are you serious? Okay, I am not the end all be all. I need you to show me how you did this. <laughs> Can that oh, yeah. help? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I always forget that Canva also is considered. Yeah. Um, okay. So let me pull up. I used to do all the dog posts for Lone Star Boxer Rescue when we were just Lone Star Boxer Rescue. Wait, hold on, you're a boxer rescue? We might in be in need of a boxer in like 20 years. Okay. Well, I'm my foster now is one who is forever. But I used to do all of their posts for, you know, like this is bear, bear is two years old, blah, blah, blah. I did those all in Canva. It was beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to need your contact information because we always have boxers. We have one boxer in one lab. That is our pair. We always have. He has hit six. So we know we only have like three more hands. I lost my 13 year old boxer last Monday. I'm so sorry. I lost, I lost, I had a dog named Bordeaux too. He's like a big mastiff. I lost him May 1st. I lost my boxer May 4th. Three days. That's so hard. That's hard. Yeah. yeah. They were nine and almost 13. Oh. That was awful. Seven days, we've got two here in the usual. Okay. All right, raw dog people, apparently. <laughs> This is fair. I want to be for every day one in the shower and power the like, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> Let me test this. I'm like, oh. when we first got him, he had been like neglected and just left out in the backyard with like four other dogs. And he was terrified of people. He wouldn't come near us for three days. I got him back in November. Please sign in and also take one of the prompt sheets. Yes, that means you too. <laughs> Am I wrong to say I, 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 I was told by professional development, even Dean's got this right here. Here, look at the piece of paper that looks old. No. It's very old. I'm a librarian. Yeah. I'll just turn it back on. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can. Um, okay. That's what I'm going to say. Just turn it off if it's not loading. Um, if you have your own computer with you, uh, please get it out. We can use that instead of the computers that are in front of you because part of this, the prompts that you have on there, on the sheets, we're going to be logging into ChatGPT. And so, depending on what your department is, I want you to take the prompts that you've been given and turn them into something for your division. So, whether it be lesson plans, if you do coding, so if you have a job and you need to create code that your students have to fix, 
even though you may already do it, or it might take 10, 15 minutes out of your time, there is a way for ChatGPT to do it as well. So that's one minute. Um, we'll also be going over how to create definitions and terms that your students can use on Quizlet. And then what's my other one? Oh, so I did one for accounting. Anybody in here from accounting? Okay, I did one for accounting and it is uh, creating a balance table for practicing skills. I don't know if you teach that. I went through the accounting textbook. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to get started. Um, we might get out here a little bit early because one of our panelists, Jared, was not able to make it today. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Brittany. I am the librarian here, and apparently I am now the AI person, which I will last me until March. Then we will be getting an AI task force. Wow. Uh, one person. Yeah, who all the entire campus on myself. So we're going to get started. We have William Wright. Am I saying the last name correctly? Yeah. Okay. Bill. Bill here, who is going to give the first presentation. So if you'd like to come up here and get started. And then Jennifer will be next. And then after, so I ask that uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, for either William or Jennifer during or after their lessons. Uh, are you talking about your little bit Yes, yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just saying. Um, okay, artificial intelligence. If you're in a uh, family situation, you recognize this little robot there. Although most people who use Android today don't agree to see the Android, they see Samsung's version of Android or something like that. Okay, I'm gonna start off with a little quiz today. That's for all educators, right? Okay. You notice one day your car is not running properly. You take it to the shop. They check in, they keep the car for a day, and they call you and tell you it's ready. When you pick the car up, of course you have to pay for it. Again, you turn around your home. Oh, I'm sorry. The mechanic tells you that that they diagnosed the problem. They just didn't determine that your your airflow sensor was bad and they replaced it. Those unfamiliar with the way cars work, the engine has a, a sensor on it that detects how much air is flowing into the engine. And the, the computer that controls the engine and combustion control um, uses that value along with other things to determine how much fuel to inject to the engine so it runs optimally and makes less pollution. So, as you're driving home, you notice this car is still not running right. In fact, I think it's running even worse than it was before. So what do you do? Well, I'm gonna give you four choices here. Return to the repair shop immediately and tell them to make it right. Well, possible problem with that is you just picked it up and they might be closed already, but it's still an option. Number two, find a new repair shop. Logic reasoning being that they didn't fix it right the first time, gonna find somebody who does fix it right. Number three, get rid of the car. Maybe buy a new car, a Toyota. You hear nothing ever goes wrong with those. Nobody can fix cars correctly anymore, right? Actually, um, a little bit believe believer that myself. They're uh, not so much mechanics nowadays as they're parts changers. And finally, you decide, well, you're gonna have to live with it a few days. You can't afford to have your car down for a couple of days anyway. So you make an, an appointment to get your car back in and uh, return to the mechanic shop for service. So which is the right choice? I'm gonna do that. You're number one. I know the right answer, but I'm not gonna lie. You know the right answer? The right answer? Yeah, there is a right answer. You know anything about the way cars work? Okay, the answer. 
Live with them for a few days since you can't afford to have your car out of service again, make an appointment. And then, like magic, your car is running like new again. And why is that? Your car has used artificial intelligence to fix itself. The computer in a car has learning functions to adjust to changes in the componentry that's feeding into that computer. In this case, your car has learned how to run with a somewhat defective airflow sensor. You put in the correct airflow sensor, and it's got to relearn how the, the correct airflow sensor. And even if you took one airflow sensor, new one out, and put another one in, there's enough slight differences in the way they, they're calibrated that it still has to learn. So then you get into the panic because they didn't explain that to you. <laughs> that's a that's a valid point. Um, although I in in well, I do a lot of work on my car myself, so I don't even fool with mechanics unless I really have to. Anything requires getting underneath the car, I pay somebody else to do it. Right. <laughs> especially, especially since I've got to the point in life where vertigo is real proper. Okay, so engine control computers and new cars are programmed to learn, i.e. make adjustments to compensate for changes in the system. Computer had to learn the characteristics of the new flow sensor to make the appropriate adjustments, thereby optimizing engine performance. This is all stuff that makes our cars run cleaner, faster, get better, get better fuel economy, all those things. You'd be amazed if you knew some of the things that they're really doing down inside. They actually monitor how the spark, how the spark sparks in the combustion chamber are determined from that. They use it that, that as an analytical tool for the combustion. Kind of interesting technology. So what is artificial intelligence? Well, one definition of it is that it's a theory and development of computer systems capable of performing tasks historically requiring human intelligence, such as recognizing speech making decisions, identifying patterns. AI is an umbrella term that encompasses a wide variety of technologies. Uh, I can I can uh, remember in my early days as I was a process control engineer, so I worked with controls a lot. There's a lot of things that the human eye could see and figure out that were really hard to program. And sometimes you just kind of had to punt the ball and tell the operator how to make the changes. Well, nowadays, a lot of that stuff has been automated. so. So that's happening. Um, decision making is still something that uh, that uh, you can teach a computer how to make decisions, but you can't teach it everything about making decisions. But anyhow, although AI is commonly used to describe a range of different technologies today, many disagree on whether what actually constitutes artificial intelligence. Rather, how much of that technology with which we see in the real world today is just highly advanced machine learning. It's merely a first step towards true artificial intelligence, what's called artificial general intelligence, AGI. See, I taught you another three letter acronym. Uh, despite physical, uh, philosophical difference over whether true artificial intelligence machines actually exist, when most people use the term AI today, they're referring to a suite of machine learning powered technologies such as ChatGPT that enable machines to perform tasks that previously only humans could do, like generating written contact, steering a car, or analyzing data. Some examples, ChatGPT. ChatGPT uses large language models to generate text in response to questions or comments that put to it. Google Translate. Translation is kind of interesting. You think off the top of your head that eh, translation is easy, you know? Hello is guten tag or bonjour, depending on what language you're talking about. But when you get more complex sentence structures, it's not always uh, easy. I remember hearing an example when I was in college where they fed a computer the term hydraulic ram. They translated it into, into some third world language. I don't know what the language was. And I don't mean that negatively, but just a, a language that was not technical. And then translated back into English, and it came back as water buffalo. So there are there are some things about translation that, that require uh, deep thought. Uh, Tesla is using computer vision to power self-driving features in their cars, um, which is something that I'm not sure is ready for prime time yet. Uh, the finance industry, this is what I find kind of interesting. Artificial intelligence capability to analyze large amounts of data enables them to detect anomalies or patterns that single signal fraudulent behavior. So I guess when I every now and then get a uh, a warning from uh, American Express that 
they've detected possible fraud with my credit card. It's their AI engine that's tell that's, that's figuring that out. Of course. Yeah. So chat GPT, um, is there machine learning in what chat GPT does? Because when I get machine learning, I'm thinking about mechanisms like a car. Right. Um, so is at first I thought before this presentation, I thought AI and machine learning were interchangeable. But Chat and GPT is not mechanized in its language learning. Yeah, there I, I think there are different flavors of the same the same concept. Um they use they use different uh different algorithm types and you know and, and of course the effect's different because of Chat GPT isn't tweaking any machinery. Right. But um and then the healthcare industry. AI power robotics could supply could support surgeries. Now the word could in there means it's probably not doing it yet, but there's research going into it. Uh, close to highly delicate organs or tissues to mitigate blood loss or risk of infection. Sounds like a good thing. Maybe. Depending on you know. The one word you don't want to hear during a surgery is oops. <laughs> Maybe that's the word of the week. Kind of oops. Um, so AGI, true artificial general intelligence, one of my heroes, Commander Dana, um, who is fully functional in, in all respects. That's here in mind of this. Anyway, AGI refers to a theor theoretical state in which computer systems will be able to achieve or exceed human intelligence. In other words, AGI is true artificial intelligence as depicted in science fiction novels, uh, such as Asimov's iRobot or television shows the Star Trek Mr. Data. Researchers don't quite agree on how we would recognize true artificial general intelligence when it happens, when it appears. It's kind of an interesting question. How do you know if that's really true artificial intelligence? There is a test and I forget the name of it. I didn't want to bog you down with the uh, details of that. Uh, nor can researchers and philosophers quite agree on whether we're beginning to achieve AGI, if it's still far off, or it's just totally impossible. I think it's impossible myself. I think it's totally far off. Like, no, Mr. Data was in like the 25th century. Come on. Um, but then again, you know, 100 years ago, nobody thought we could split the atom either. So the pace of science goes quicker and quicker every every day every day. So one can assume, however, that when someone uses the term artificial general intelligence, they're referring to the kind of sentient computer programs and machines that are commonly found in popular science fiction. So in conclusion, AI can and should be another tool in our tool toolbox. I mean there's a lot of positive things come out of AI. You just have to be careful that you're that you're uh, using the positive stuff and you recognize the negative stuff. I mean I'm I'm a little bit scared right now about the computer that can truly think. One of the things that the iRobot had in it was the laws of robotics that were, that were created. Like, you know, they, they, a computer or a robot can't harm a human either by action or inaction. You know, and there's a number of things that, and uh, somewhere along the way, somebody figured out how to shortcut, shortcut those laws and it caused all kinds of problems. But anyhow, um, Use it, embrace it as we've embraced the other te other technologies. As technologies come along, we first kind of say, you know, I'm not sure this is going to be of any value, and then you find yourself using it as well. Um, I've never used AI to create a presentation. I'm going to have to look into that. Nor have I used to find the test because they all wanted to find the garage. Maybe that maybe that's kitty cat part because you want to tell us. Huh? And they, 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 there's, there's some kind of network for the, the strays and the, the raccoons and the possums. They all know where to go. All know where to go. It's yeah. called putting your food in the garage. <laughs> really? Um, anyway, I suspect it's only the beginning. It's going to be an exciting ride. Paradigms, and paradigm shifts always are. I always wanted to use the word paradigm. And uh, so don't be, don't be left behind. Okay. I have a paradigm here if you'd like it. But. Really? Right, Roger. Yeah. Uh, 
I think that's what it's yeah, called. Yeah, correct that. There's a paradigm. Everybody shifts, right? <laughs> Anyhow. And by the way, if you don't know anything about Isaac Asimov, he was a he was a true uh, academician as well as a science fiction writer. He has a PhD in biochemistry or something. One of his uh, tests that he imposed on himself to see if he could write a um, proper thesis for his PhD was he wrote a science fiction story about some make believe chemical, and he published it under a pseudonym. Because he didn't want his professors and all to know he was playing around with. Well, when he went for him to, to defend his thesis, the first question they asked him was about this story that he was in. Anyway, well done. Thank you. Right. Oh. Questions, concerns, compliments? Oh. Yeah. 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 What I tell my students when it comes to like, well, we might show them I have a couple of FBI component mm -hmm. is right, artificial intelligence. Kind of says it on the label. Artificial means it's not real. Artificial kind of says so. Um, so my general question is: When we use artificial intelligence, how do we validate? Like, how do we validate that the information that we're getting is correct? Is correct. Yeah. That's something that you have to do. So it's the same thing that I tell the students whenever they ask for: um, How do I know if the I have this a lot. How do I know the citations that they're giving me are correct? And they say, okay, what's the first thing that you go to whenever you're wanting to know the answer to something? Google, Google, Safari, Microsoft Edge. So you take whatever it is that it's giving you and you need to reverse research. If it's something that that's important to you, you're going to put it into a paper, you're going to put it into a discipline board, you're going to be showing your peers, you need to make sure that it's correct. And it's something you're going to spend money. Yeah. I, 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 like that. I have students for the study guide and clearly he had tech GPT to all of the answers. So a lot of them were off base completely. I, mean, I teach computer networking and he was giving me answers about social media, like the cancellation. The other thing that I will say is that um, we were just reading an article this morning about how chat GPT specifically. So, first of all, the Turing test, there's only been two artificial intelligence programs that have ever passed the Turing test and ChatGPT is one of them. So it is considered artificial intelligence, true artificial intelligence based on that test. Um, the other thing was is that the article we were reading this morning is that ChatGPT is now recognizing the way that you type and it puts it into a memory bank. It will, so if you, if you type in one question and the, the example it gave was a professor said, give me the history of Malachite. And so what ChatGPT did is gave them the answer, but then there's a memory setting. And whenever you click on the memory setting, it showed that ChatGPT kept that he was interested in Malachite. So anytime that he could type in talking about love or relationships or anything like that, it would remember that, okay, this person is interested in this. So it now keeps track of what you're telling it. Because you do have to sign in with the account. So it's always going to fall under your profile. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now. Uh, Jennifer is next. My husband and I were talking in our house one day, we did have to the Alexa, and we were talking about CPR. And both of us got ads on our Facebook feed for CPR classes. Terrible. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I don't see what's going on. But I was, um, I was in a history class where we were doing this, and you had a question, Carol. Uh, we were doing uh, history of fire. You know, we're doing an uh, honor guard class, and the teachers were talking about uh, chat GPT, and it'll make stuff out of school plot. But you can actually just like we were talking about artists, and um, we we're talking about different kinds of artists in the modern era. It'll just make shit up, <laughs> it literally makes stuff up. It's like that's not true, and and so 
for yeah, just like for your question, what should that lady have stand turns up in? Yeah, the teacher's immediately compelled, like, okay, yeah. this is not the way it, it is written, it's not, uh, it's not actual in data. Yeah. So it'll make some of this point students to say, okay, this is modern art, this is an artist in that category, and you can't differentiate sometimes between now it's getting better. But if you can't differentiate between this artist or this artist or this artist and it's like, well, this is generic stuff. So we're going to the same thing. Because it must be true for one, so it's true. The, the answer I got was correct, but not in context. No, sorry. Yeah, that's why a lot of our anyone who is doing reading or research or as we're starting to make it into something about art because it's very hard for the ChatGPT to teach or recognize artists or for them what he works like. Yes. Okay, you ready? I really didn't think so. You guys already covered everything I was going to say, so we're done. So, yeah, um, AI, you guys already know a little bit about it, definitely rapidly developing. And I actually taught an AI class to, for uh, in the summer to eight year olds, eight to 10 year olds. So I taught them how to create chatbots. And so I do see, and I have taken classes in artificial intelligence and machine learning. They go together and I'll show you why and how, but basically the behind the scenes, what everybody's doing, the programmers and all, um, they're, they're using statistics. And they're using uh, everything that you type in. And right now you'll, you'll watch me type in, everything you type in is going into the, in, and feeding their algorithm. I decide like, what do you want? Oh, okay. I, and I know you like this, so like y'all said, um, it's feeding off of, so at the very beginning, like the say before 2018, it would feed off of what you would type. And now it's feeding off of everything. So that, that's the thing. There are different types of AI. We've actually gone to uh, this, uh, the most powerful type of, uh, the most powerful types. So these are the different types of chat box we have. At the very beginning, they were just menu driven and they were just running off of rules that were, that they were taught. And then all of a sudden we started getting AI powered, what they called AI powered, which was, oh, now it's watching what you're typing and it's it's using natural language processing to actually decipher what you're what you're going to say in the future using statistics and the K means models. Whenever they say they're trained on this certain model, it's it's they're telling you that um, they're using mathematics in the background and to to figure out uh, and try to predict. Um, statistically, what you're going to say and what you're going to do, depending on it. The the important part about this, um, these the I think I I, oh, I was told I was going to be a panelist. So like so, when I started, I started catching up on AI because I had a flip year. My my son is one year old. So one year of I've been away from kind of uh, my research and other than my PhD one, but um, AI has really really gotten. Uh, like advanced in this past year, actually in 2023, and we're expecting it to get even better in 2024, and and so on. So a lot of these um, are the chatbots that they're using. Your students are using these to to create their work, to to actually come up with answering your questions and learning. Because I do the main thing I tell my students is, they're like, are you really going to allow black box AI? Are you really going to do that? That's that's the chat GPT for programmers. That's going to create a whole program. Uh, you just tell it what to do, and it'll create the program for you. You give it the language, and then boom. And I'm like, let's use it right now. I'm teaching you HTML. I'm going to go ahead and let's create a web page. Just create the server using C++. Let's have it do it for you. And we blast it. I blasted it, and I'm like, do you understand what it's saying? No, that's why you're sitting here. You're sitting here so that you learn what it's because it's already been taught, but have you been taught? So when whenever they actually come up with the answers, um, when you know with this chat GPT stuff, we do have to ask them, do you know what what the answer really is? Like the chatbot gave you the answer, or AI gave you the answer, but do you know what it is? So what I have them do is create lots of comments and a lot of discussion board problems now, <laughs> because I want them, like you said. AI cannot replicate our feelings, our creativity, all that. This, that that's the thing that you can't do. So that's where I'm targeting my discussion questions to go and ask them, why did why did you come up with this solution? And how do you feel about that? And how would your user feel when they see this front end or, or 
um, if they would experience this. So, so th there's a lot of questions with what can it do and what can it can it not do. So definitely automation, digital assistance. We've got you know assistance all over the place. We had uh, the Google Home. Y'all know what Google Home assistants are, right? And the Alexa, and everybody's got an assistant now. Even the banking uh, companies, the banking systems got in on it. Um, they make unbiased decisions. They've got data analysis, art design. Um, these are things that um, they can do. Um, we actually can, and I'll show you right now, uh, you can tell it to create artwork. And that's the part that uh, generative AI is actually doing. You're telling, give me a picture of this and it'll create it for you. It'll, it'll say with this, with that, and you just talk to it and it'll start creating one for you. Not the greatest models. Um, you have to pay for the really good models, uh, but yeah, definitely it's out there. Um, what can it not do? It's definitely not yet. It can't multitask. It can't explain its decisions. It doesn't know why it gave me that answer. And empathy, it cannot uh, be creative. It's uh, fully cannot replace human workers. That's another major thing that's gonna come to your head right now. I'm like, I was, at first I was like, GPT, GPT, oh my God, what the heck? I, and I had to put my video down and say, what's going on here with AI? And no, it's it's still, um, it, they need, they, we're, they're still gonna need units. At the very beginning, like in the, the Industrial Revolution, they had, before the Industrial Revolution, they used to tailor our suits and stuff, or the men's suits. And then when they said, oh, now we're gonna automate this. And, and now we have to live with, if you're a size eight or a size 10, good, but if you're a size nine, they don't tailor unless you wanna pay up. So we, we are gonna live in a world where um, things are not gonna be as customized as we're used to. It'll all be like, yeah, we're gonna go with whatever the AI says and we'll go with that model, we'll go with that decision. Um, so at the very beginning, it was like that. Uh, we have Wikipedia. I remember my high school teachers were always like, don't use Wikipedia because it's got bad information. So if it, and same thing happens here with AI, um, and now everybody uses Wikipedia. Um, AI, if it's trained on a bad model, if someone, if, if they start incorporating things that you consider bad and they're, they're incorporating training using that model, that's when things get scary. So um, Lester Holt from NBC News actually is holding some, some um, like some chats just like this, but with the Microsoft people, the Tesla people, all the engineers. So he's actually asking them these questions. And what I did was I didn't watch the video. I had AI watch the video for me, and I actually had it summarize everything, all the data points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have ChatGPT that everybody knows about right now. Um, Note GPT. Um, that's the one where you insert the video, and it'll it'll summarize it for you. It'll put um, all of our captioning, like whatever you said, and I actually uh, can use it in like as a professor to go ahead and caption all of my stuff. It'll, it'll just it'll upload my video that I recorded using WebEx and then it'll go and caption everything for me. It'll summarize everything for me. It can also, you can use Canva to create the PowerPoint keynote. So you can definitely create like everything all in one. So embrace it, embrace it. Get to know these, these uh, new chat GPT things, the AI models, everything to embrace it and make, make your uh, life easier actually. Um, <laughs> Blackbox AI is actually chat GPT for programming. I did mention that a little bit a while ago. Um, Crayon AI is a free one, not the greatest, but I'll show you that Crayon AI, it creates images for keyboard type, uh, when you type in your text box, uh, it, it actually takes some of the images and trains the data depending on those images. When, so we've got metadata behind the scenes picking up on, on those images. Um, Eleven Labs is a software company that actually, this is the scary part that they're talking about at the NBC uh, with um, Dr. Holt, um, where it can impersonate you and your voice. And so it can train on just a video of yours that you've uploaded from the students. It can actually um, go in and get trained and then you tell it, uh, they have a raspy voice or a raspier or they have an English accent. So it goes and it changes the voice and it does that. You can also, <laughs> <laughs> so some of the so all that all that stuff is actually um they're raising a bunch of questions so there are a bunch of common questions that are that are coming up um there's a whole list of, of jobs actually 
that have been impacted by impacted. That doesn't mean we're going to be inundated. This is one of the first times that some kind of automation or some kind of uh, invention um, impacts um, jobs where you have to go to school for. So that's why a lot of people are up in arms like what's going on. Uh, what is this whole AI thing? And I'm telling you, they still need you. And they will for a long time. So, <laughs> so the top 20 occupations there, what, there was a study. Um, I'm going to tell you I cheated and I uh, was listening to a podcast, Edu Search, and they're constantly talking about um, education and AI and anything that's impacting uh, education. And they just made a law, Biden just passed a law. They're trying to get AI and get everybody to understand and try not try to oh, not create a, like a digital divide. There was a digital divide because people didn't have computers, but now there'll be a digital uh, an AI divide into the people that do not catch on. They're like oh, ignoring AI, and then the people that actually you know search and actually go with it and actually learn about it and use it to benefit their their uh, their jobs and and creating decisions actually. Um, business people are going to be impacted. Banks um, and real estate are some of the ones that are impacted a great deal. Um, let me show you. But I just have a couple of tabs to show you. Pop them up here. No, um, let me show you the paper. <laughs> let me the paper. Um, that still does the jobs, and they're just the way they figure this out is. They took uh, the job description and they checked to see what was needed to actually complete the job. And then they checked to see if the AI models, all these new things were actually going to affect these jobs and affect. That means that you're not going to be essentially eliminated. Yes, there were seamstresses that were like, and, and people with tailors that, that had to kind of like, you know, get with the, get with the new stuff. And, and then they started, they kept making money. But if you sit back and you're just like, I'm just gonna you know, let it take over me. I mean, that's another thing. So I, I think that what they're saying at NYU and Princeton, all these university professors are saying, it's just gonna change things. It's gonna look a little different, but it's not gonna be, and if you ask technology people, they're like, oh, it's gonna be like tomorrow, but it's not, it's it's gonna be gradual. And I, I'm a technology person and I'm a professor at the same time. And I'm like, nah, I know how these things happen. and and it, it will be, it will take time, sorry. So what AI tool is used in, in complex um, scientific analysis? Like if I have a chemistry problem that's multi-step, balance this chemical equation, and then do these other things, right? Answer these questions, you know, units and all that kind of stuff. Is there an it's, AI tool that does that? Yeah, I did it. I haven't been taught math in a couple of years, but. But yeah, definitely, I know that because my best friend is a math teacher and they're definitely plenty of those. So that's why one of the jobs here is a math professor because um, now, and, and I told my, I told her that it's basically, they're gonna find the answer, but back in the day, we used to actually look at the solutions manual and find the answer, but we had to kind of like work our way back and say, oh, that's the answer. Now I know how to get from beginning to end. And, but there are some like a check, all that stuff that's giving them the answer. They're just giving them, and now they're getting a little bit better with uh, the symbols and everything for mathematics. So it's getting really successful. You can actually upload all those. It has a whole, a whole uh, library of them. I saw it yesterday. Um, I was like, oof, like now it's going to be tough, and she's going to have to uh, change her. her so with that being said about math, mm -hmm. it gets it wrong a lot. So that's part of what we're doing with the math department, and they're using ChatGPT right now to create problems and then have ChatGPT solve them, it's very bad at solving problems. So and I tested it between Google Bard and ChatGPT kind of statistics right now. So I had it do a standard deviation for a test I was running in SPSS and it came back. So ChatGPT hasn't caught up with math, thankfully, but it will get there like you were saying. Yeah, there are others there are other tools that they get. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 yeah. 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 It, they they um yeah, they got creative. Uh, uh, exactly what happened across this industry when we started automating roles of yeah. roll computer in the door and everybody thinks the first thing they're gonna lay everybody off and it never happened. Yeah. Um, 
it just it just automated so things. Got the basics of the, of the algorithm yeah. the change with that. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Like, I, I kind of wanted to sit back. Like I said, I wasn't really paying attention. I was like, I don't like this thing. I mean, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to roll with it. <laughs> you're going to have to figure it out and, and have it work for you. Like, have it uh, figure out how it works so that you can actually, um, like, whatever you fear, definitely you, you have to get to know more about it so that you can get to the bottom of it. So, uh, yeah, so many concerns that you have talked about in the, in the podcast, they talk about the auto, the auto industry also, and that they thought that they were going to lose their jobs, but it was definitely exactly what you said. That's, that's what they're saying there. Um, yeah, Lester definitely asked some pretty cool questions to that Microsoft guy, and he said, AI's ability to mimic human thinking and emotions brings both a potential of benefits and risks at the same time, um, but definitely we need to embrace it. Definitely need to embrace it um, on here. Uh, what is the potential? What's the potential? He has a lot of things on his mind. They've got a lot of projects going on. He's asking Google's actually shaking because Google, it used to be that we used to search, people used to search things using Google. Now they're going to chat GPT. Now they're going to these AI models and they're going to have to re rebound. They even, it used to be called BARD, their AI system. Now it's called Gemini. Gemini, Gemini. Yeah. I was like, what are those those star things? The astronomical. Um, yeah, the bars went to Gemini. So they're actually changing everything around because these these things are happening. Huh? So I think that I was the the one that I was in yesterday with that one. So we're talking about that's on some part. But Microsoft is really bought in and has this big partnership um, with um, yeah, OpenAI. Okay. But they um, they have Copilot. Um, um, in your and if you go to Bing search, there's a little option that is yeah. profile and it's it's right there in the Super Yes, that's, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 within the Super Bowl, it's one of the biggest selling out. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. <laughs> and I didn't mean to jump ahead of your no, 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 yeah, that's it's it's like a Gemini's uh competition. So here in Gemini, if I tell them I'm going to my graduation in San Diego in May. It's going to start giving me flights. It's going to start giving me um, some uh, either hotels or anything like that. I don't want to do that because I know what's going to happen later. They're going to say, oh, she's about to graduate. She's going to go graduate here. Then I'm going to pick up the price because she's going to, it's going to be in demand. So I, I actually opened it up and I'm going to tell you what it does, but I know that they're going to be out there. There's, there's business. It's always about business, right? It's always about money and that will happen. So what I do when I, when I plan a trip, is I plan it on one computer, then I grab my best friend's computer and start like looking and and finding a good a good deal. Then I go find it uh, another deal on hers, and then on the one that gives me the smallest number, that's where I go and I, I put in my information. So uh, it's it, it, it's really scary. If you go to Expedia today and you type in a flight to go somewhere, you go tomorrow, they'll type the bottom of yeah. the And it's in your, your computer. It's in actually when they sign in. Like right there that I'm signed in I'm with my Google account, that Google account, I had to make a new account uh, for ChatGPT so that I can create, like, I was going to show you all what it is. But, uh, but yeah, definitely this is what I was um, create um, HTML page with C++ as uh, backend, backend. And what it does is I don't teach C++ to my HTML students, but I don't have this to make it back to K-Fall. That's what you're going It was so much fun. Yeah, so I can teach the HTML and I don't have to worry about the backend and they're going to know how it works. So it's almost going to, I kind of tell them, you're going to have to pick up the pace. If you're going to use ChatGPT and all these AI models, we're going to pick up the education. We're going to pick up the bar in education because I'm teaching you HTML, but now chat GPT or this little guy is going to give you, black box is going to give you the C++ part of it, the part that I couldn't teach because I'm restricted to a certain part of the curriculum. And now I'm like, oh, I don't need to teach you, but here it is. And we put them together and they can actually see the work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's stuff that I can't teach. You go find it out in the AI and I'm going to hold you to it. And now we're going to go and even and like improve our web pages and web design. So uh, that we actually use Blackbox, and I'm not going to mess with Blackbox, but um, right there because it's going to pick up on my style of programming. 
but because it's checking everything that I'm doing, it's training every time that I do this. Um, this note one, this is what I did to find out what Lester Holt was talking about because I heard, I was watching uh, a show and that's where he came out. He said, if I do this, you upload the YouTube link and then it goes and it summarizes everything for you. So you definitely use that. They can use, I'm like, use whatever you gotta use. We're, we're, gonna, we're all gonna get smart here. <laughs> Here I'm saying happy birthday, happy birthday to my son, but his name is Lincoln. So look at this type of, oh God, this is not perfect. <laughs> this is not perfect yet. <laughs> Word um, and it's really grading. I wanted a cake with the saying happy birthday Lincoln, just like, but this is not the non-paid version. I'm pretty sure the other models are better. Um, so another thing that they have 11 labs is um, I started training it with my voice. And now I can, it, it's got my voice on there. And um, I just, it's not the greatest, but I can get it Sure, sure, sure. Oh, the, oh, it's weird in here. If you can figure it out. <laughs> okay. Well, we can just do this and um, it is here. Let's see if it does what you just did. And that was whispering. So it kind of did grab. A little bit of my voice box. Is it perfect? Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and not not uh, keep going um, because I I didn't want to train it. I trained it on one. I said I I trained it for 30 seconds. So I said the alphabet and the numbers, and I know what I I I know how to train it better, but I don't want to. Um, there's also. Uh, Canva did the PowerPoint presentation for me. I just told it what I wanted it to to kind of uh, do. So Canva, what it, what I kind of wanted, and they have an AI section. There's a section that's not AI, but there's an AI section that that can help you out. <laughs> so I, like I said, I, years ago uh, in 2016, 17, and 18, and 19, I was teaching actually kids in China and Dubai on how to make uh, how to work with AI made chatbots. So this, if you link this, this is called dialogue flow, and you link this to your Google Assistant, like whatever email you use with your Google Assistant, you log in and you can train it to say whatever you want. So what, what I did was I trained it go here and you say, um, you create an entity and I had uh, Steve Rogers. You all know who that is? Yeah. <laughs> so you're my, my training, this is what I trained it on. Uh, that whenever somebody types in Steve Rogers, it's going to say so it's going to chat back to you. It's going to say that's Captain America or must be the captain or must be Steve Rogers or something. And so you just, those are all the more. So these are the training pieces that I put in there that were just text. But imagine what it gets out of all your computer. So right now it used to be that we would type in our training models and, and they, they would hire people to say, hey, we, we need people to, to train our models. That means you would put stuff in there now. We're using the computer to actually train the computer. So if that's why it's gender, it's called generative AI. That's, that means that it's like the next level. That's a little bit more, uh, I don't know if I, I went to that part of it. Um, yeah, the most powerful one is generative AI. That, whenever they say generative AI, that's more intelligent than the regular AI. And the, the one I showed you was regular AI, what the kids were doing. Now they're using generative AI. At GPT, they're all generative AI. Um, so, uh -huh. so is the computer then validating, taking validation steps? It's training another computer or learning from another. So it, it okay. So that's another thing, like valid. Like, it, is it is it valid data? Are you doing the right thing? That's a human having to make sure and check to see if that's working or not. We've got testers. We've got uh, people probing. To make sure that the models are training the right way. Um, yes, so that's one of the things that Lester Holt was talking about. That we have uh, some, there are some robocalls that are out there with the voice of the person that is running for president. So it's starting to um, affect our society in this way. And the models are trained with false data, and then they're also impersonating the face of the president. So, um, so that and or whoever's running. So they were, that's why they were putting in place all these rules because of all that that's happening. And they don't, they're, last, the last election was determined by uh, minorities. So minorities are going to be targeted with um, false data and, and, and the training model is, they're gonna be training with false information. That's what they're doing. 
So that's what they're trying to stop. That's why in industry, they're asking us, like, um, what, how do you feel about ethics and ethics of, of programming? And are you going to, like, how would you program this? And so there are some questions that are still spinning around in, in, the, in the industry that, uh, again, the, we need to make sure that the information that we train it on is valid, that it's real, that it's true, and that it's not false information. Because it's going to kind of feel kind of weird. Uh, it's going to there's it's going to feel weird. <laughs> it's going it's going to be a bumpy ride, but we're definitely going to be able to identify these. Uh, yeah, thanks for doing that. This is like a steroid. Oh my. Okay, I thought I was just showing you everything you already know. I was like, no. stop there. No. So some of the things that I'm doing as a professor is definitely um, just giving them, creating discussion questions that where they have to actually require, for, I've, I've already said this, sort of require critical thinking using images as, and the assignment prompts. Because if you just put a bunch of words, they're just going to grab it and paste it. And I want them to actually, if they're going to go in and there is one where you can put the image and it'll take out the text for you. If they're going to go through all that work, somewhere along the way, they're going to read and they're actually going to make it their own. Uh, require collaboration, require comments on why they chose that answer because uh, chat GPT won't tell them why. It'll just tell them the answer at this point. Yep. And so that's how I'm changing things. And there's my reference page with everything that I use. But definitely that podcast is awesome. Ed, Ed Search Podcast. So if y'all want to just put when you're driving, I should just put it on. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Do we need to Presenting the building for PowerPoints over to over to Roger and Roger can send it off to the entire division and he posts next enough to do that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. You all. Thank you so much. I can talk to you today. So that must be very happy. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So now we're to talk right off. Okay. Um, PC. There we go. Figure it out. Give me a second. No, you're good. Um, so really quick, I want everybody on their computer, who has already used ChatGPT before? A little. As long as they have technology. All right, so you're logged in. I want you to go ahead and go to open.ai or just Google ChatGPT. If you don't feel comfortable using it, that is okay as well. And the prompts that I've given you, I didn't know what departments would be here today. So I did accounting business law, um, and then I gave some JavaScript. Uh, so you can take the prompts, and I want you to, you can log in using your Gmail, you can use your Lone Star email, whatever it is that you want to use. And I want you to take the prompts, and I want you to apply them to your class. And the reason I'm doing this is because what I've realized is that this might be a lot of the little stuff that you're having to do for your class that takes 20, 30 minutes out of your time. It's a possibility or even lesson plans. If you have to create lesson plans, creating a syllabus, all of those things, it can be done on ChatGPT. That takes away those little tiny things you no longer have to do. Therefore, you can focus on something else. Oh, holy cow. What did you what did you I put in create a Cisco router configuration and it put in everything including that. So I will wow. show you that if you ask it, so for here, I'm currently writing an application uh for great here on campus i asked it to write a paragraph to make it more inclusive and emotional no. it gave me an error and so it gave me nothing and i tried it you can see right here new chat one two three four i tried it five times and it continuously gave me a network error anytime i asked it to be more personable or if i asked it to put more emotion into the paragraph i was writing it told me no Bye -bye. So then I went over to Gemini and I was like, will you do this for me? And Gemini was like, absolutely. Thank you. Oh. Create DHCP hat SSH 
the TPSO Yeah, so one for accounting, I thought was really cool. It was fun doing the prompts for this division, I will say that, because I don't know a lot about what you all do. So this was a learning curve for me. So this is kind of a um, tie in with what we were doing with what we are. So a big thing with people saying no to doing open resources or doing OER or open access is a lot of the supplemental materials that don't come with it. We have found you can just create the supplemental materials within seconds. Yes. So just put it for thought. I'll send it out there. I love it. I use it. I've showed students how to use it for Critical thinking skills, whenever it comes to creating keywords as a librarian, I've used it to start on their thesis and get an idea on something they can do. So I also use it. And the number one thing that I have read everywhere is that you need to start teaching your students how to use it and how to use it properly. Because, yes. Oh, okay. Because what I've seen is that they're going to in interview processes or um, if they, for example, have to give a 15 minute information session about something, most of starting in the future, they're going to ask them, how can you use AI to make this quicker? That's a lot of what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in three, we're having a conversation about AI. Uh, I was listening to um, the presentations that I thought. Yeah. Both were actual, very not actual, but both both were pretty incredible um, presentations, and there are some takeaways along with some of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, we're about twenty one years away from this event that Ray Kurzweil has labeled as the singularity. That's the point where AI is or computers are supposed to equal or now begin the process of superseding human intelligence. And so that's 2045 where that's supposed to happen. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, romanticism around technology, as Jennifer pointed out in her presentation, where we get caught up in this idea of the technology is going to overtake us. Uh, the 1984, George Orwell, Terminator, I robot, uh, Independence Day, all of this stuff. And there's always this, this, this fear of, of humanity feeling helpless against some kind of an enemy that um, is too powerful and it's something of our own doing. It's something that we created and this was happening under our knowledge the entire time. And then we feel um, that we created this monster. So we have to always be on guard that this monster doesn't come and get us and that this thing that we have is better than us. Um, as we think about technology in the education space, though, um, it, it's, we got to start at the core of what all of this is, right? All of us have been students. And the first thing that we all care about is fast. That's the number one thing that everybody walks into our classrooms. They're not particularly concerned with learning right away. They want to know if I take CDOP's class. And, <laughs> and so when I like to go with the students of color, you're looking at the transition of grades. You know, that's not why you're here. You're actually going to have Send up with the arguments. This is our story about what we do and the grade will fall on that. Absolutely not. And that's the very idealistic response to sure. and I have a lot of students who just care about the same here. So right. And so that's the piece that we all as educators um navigate. And so um students are doing whatever it is that they can pass the class because I mean like background 
all of these things. And so we kind of fall into this, but we're the vanguards of education, right? So we want to make sure you're certifying your knowledge. You know, if, if you're making a game and you came to Lone Star, Larry's concerned that you would have the right techniques to go out in industry and represent what we taught here. And so it, it kind of falls on us a bit in, in the sense of understanding how technology came, right? And with understanding the evolution. It used to be um, when I was teaching programming more ardently, Stack Overflow was my website. So when Jennifer knows, she laughed because it's you. And now you get this real time feel because I can put in a prop. And I remember the last time I taught, which was um, last spring, eight week one, the student is like, not answering, I'm not understanding the question. We ask the question because I'm not getting it. And I'm like, hey, you're trying to get this variable to do this, and you're trying to get to store this value, and you're trying to get it out of the theory. And she's like, I'm not understanding the question. And we buy this. She has a all program code ready for me. I'm like, I don't need ChatGPT. <laughs> so, to Jennifer's point, what do we do then? Can we, can we really sit down and fight this? Can we really sit down and, and say students can't pull resources? You know, you could, in that case, you could actually say, that's fantastic. Explain to me what you wrote. Right. That's why I like what Jennifer says. This is the this is the pivot because this is a real pivot in education for us to now say, okay, we understand that these are known problems. We can solve everything that we do in education is a known problem. We're not really anything new. You've done bust out before. It's just a different model that you're working with. But the principles remain the same. So now this is the pivot of Okay, you can figure it out, but what do I can do? Because I can tell a 10 year old to also go to chat and see if they do the same thing that you did. What qualifies you? And this is what puts us in a, in, a, in, a, in a better place to educate our students. So it's not just about producing answers. Everybody can do that. What makes us valuable? is to actually present a proposition to the learning space that now, this is not the only thing we can do. We can't just produce answers, but we can think critically about what the solution is that we're looking for. The last thing is about trust. Um, our students are putting trust behind. That if the computer told me this is what the answer is, this is what the answer is. We have to equip ourselves. Exactly, it's faith and trust. So we we are the ones who have to just based on what, like like you said, Brittany. We are the ones who have to now go back and re validate things because the truth is AI might not get it right today, and that's because it's looking through its resources of connected materials and saying. Oh, this is the best I can do right now. So we're really getting the best effort of AI. And the more you feed it, the more it learns, and it can eventually answer those questions. It will eventually draw somebody with five fingers and not seven. <laughs> but, you, you know, it's getting there. So um, the trust, I know we we're afraid of the actors. There's a whole deep fake community that's out there. Um, we've heard it happen in political spaces before, and it's packed with these type of election efforts and all of this stuff. We just have to always be aware. It's not about fear, though. And that's the one thing that I would love for at least us to not worry about. It's, it, it's not something to be afraid of, it's something to be in front of. And we can definitely use it to our advantage rather than being afraid of this thing. And then we miss out on strengthening learning opportunities because of all of this. But I mean, I, what I, I, I impress upon my students that they're cheating themselves out of learning if they immediately go to these instant solutions. And 
that it's not going to work for you or you have to produce that big day in order to work in an environment in front of people, right? You don't have your computer to ask those questions to answer. If you're in a debate or in a conversation, finding a solution to a problem in your team of people, you have to use your, your brain that you develop in this class by doing these problems. And that's it. And that's the other reason that I impress upon them on written solutions, have them write their solutions to problems with their hand on paper. I tell them that they're using their brain to do that. And that's how they create wrinkles in their brain to run. That's how they repeat it, you know, because you write it in your head. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's what I do. So we're doing graphics design, doing 3D animations in video, doing multimedia. And one of the conversations that we've been having for the last decades since I've been teaching this is how do we show our work? Because when you go to get a job, if you just show the final outcome, again, just to your point, a final outcome is just show me an image, slot the image up. They have to show sketches, they have to show process, they have to show texture map, they have to show wireframes, they have to show all their process to get there. And in their portfolio, we want to see what's called a process book. We want to see, and there's a thing called mind mapping where you're thinking about here's a word, and then we branch out there. So we're doing our brainstorming concepts. And so what I'm trying to get the students to do, which is what we've been doing under actually if I have to implement this with their design on two class, is process books. Process books is shown from day from day one. You were given a problem. What was the problem? And then you are the person who are having to solve this problem. You begin to show all your different ways you try to solve this problem until you get to the final point. That's what employers are looking for. Because as I tell my students, they're not looking for you to hire for the final output. They could, you know, hire that chat GPT that would not go. I would think that would be going to go today. It's like they could just mid journey in, right? Boom, image. They're looking for thought processes that they can work with people that can actually think about processes and how they can um, come up with solutions that we haven't seen before. And that because unfortunately, with, especially with images, the biggest problem with images right now is all they're doing is ripping off other images. <laughs> That's all they do. And that, I mean, it, it's it's barely starting in you. Um, and what's really interesting is there was this one really funny image. My daughter was working for a new Cambridge Farms. Um, as a professional, and they did um, botanical illustrations, and for strawberries and blueberries, great. We got the, uh, she got the most unique looking strawberries and blueberries and plants because it didn't understand how to actually work them. Now it's gotten better in the year and a half since they did that project. We can test it out now, and it knows what strawberries, knows what blueberries, knows how to differentiate the two. But you have to know how to feed the uh, prompt properly, which would be kind of interesting. Like, how do I feed the prompt properly? Get the output that I'm looking for. But yeah, we, we're talking about process, and that's what we're talking about with the students. Like, you need to show the process process now. <laughs> or English or history. What was your research? All that kind of stuff. Because, you know, that's where our human thinking is. But I love the idea that the more we feed uh, chat GPT, we kind of dumbing it down to idiocracy. As we as humans are asking in student stuff. <laughs> like that idea. Like, but also remember that the, the idea of technology is crucial. So I know I had a I had a debate with uh, my mother in law, my uncle who was or her brother who was alive at the time and but um we had the conversation and he was mostly talking about the automation in of the most of the auto industry and how many jobs were lost. And my my argument to him was if I know that I can be more precise, less mistakes, because I've just eliminated a lot of human error as a business person, I wouldn't. Is it my responsibility to make sure that everybody has a job as a business, or is it to hire people who I need to make my product go great? So, okay. What technology is doing is increasing people. It's increasing our abilities to do more. Now I don't have to remember everybody's phone number in here as the dean because I got you right. 
That's too important to remember. Of course. Oh, yeah, no. But when you used to, if you, we said, oh, everybody might know. Go ahead, go ahead. But that's what technology does, right? It allows us to offload things that are more venial. I mean, am I less of a nice person because I have your phone number <laughs> in my phone versus I remember it? You see what I'm saying? So technology does have a benefit and it can help us as a structure. So really quick, um, and I'm going to end up with three more things. And if you want to have an outside conversation about this, you are more than welcome to. So the three of us just put in the exact same prompt. And the three of us all got different sure. answers. Uh, which I, I think it's funny because I, I just like that it doesn't understand what it's like, how different people are asking. Because it gave me this like very pretty, here's how you can look at all of your assets and whatnot. And it's almost like it's drawing on the things that I've already asked it before in different conversations. Awesome. Because I have asked it to create a balance sheet for me for my own personal finances. And I feel like that's kind of what it just gave me. Okay. Now for you two, no idea why it's completely different. That could be. I was just going to say that I did it in um, co-pilot out of curiosity, and it actually made a little bit of I just kind of see what its take on this would be. And then I would pull back from that. It's like, okay, how would I actually, and I would go back to the different um, prompts. And you can't just use it like straightforward. But because I've already put in all the details of what I want, and I haven't kind of rewrite it as more academic or whatever, I could then use like five or six times I had to rewrite to actually write something that sounds or I paper sense. I'm using that human learning based on machine learning. So I don't have to sit there and figure out every single. Because I hope somebody spends trying to the crap out of the paper, right? I know that yeah. with my doctorate. I'm going to be really honest. I write an entire literature review out for my doctorate and I'll put it into chat GPT and I'm like, look, is there a more formal way that I can do this? Because my typing is not super formal. And so then it gives me, yeah, and it'll give me words, but it's information I've curated. It's information that I've researched and I make sure it keeps everything in there. You can tell chat GPT to write this in a more formal to to change its tone, which gives you a different way, a different feel. Of give it, it a role. Right? The thing that I do is I always give it a role. So I give it a role as a doctorate student, or if I'm doing something here for my students, I'll put it right at a community college level. Uh, so I have it right at different levels, which that's the easiest thing to do is give it a role. It's a professor. It's the librarian. Tell it what to do. I don't ask you to do research. What I thought was interesting though, I just asked you a question and it says, as of my last day of the update in January 2022, I don't have direct access to browse the internet or access specific databases. Nope. Because then you you have to pay for upgraded to get that. For any information after 20, it's, it's September 1st, 2022, right? That's exactly okay, January. So for any information after 2022, you have to pay for the updated version. Okay. So, so search internet before. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna end this early so that you can all I know Friday you can get out. Also, I would like to eat lunch before I go out my next meeting. Uh, so two things. One, I will send this out. I have an AI guide online. Um, I have a lot of the AI software that you can use in classrooms. Uh, and then also, if you do, I don't know if you have to do citations and anything, but there are also citations on here if your students do use it. Uh, and then I also have the AI detection resources. And then if you want, I always update with reading that we have either here at the library or things that I have found online that can kind of give you 
different ways to use it in the classroom as well. And then that's this is. I knew nothing about AI. And then I was told I have to do everything on campus about AI. Uh, so this book has been my holy grail. It is the reason why uh, I can go through and give prompts and do a lot of things in ChatGPT and pull cool certain things for me. Um, I did the old school thing and I read a book. <laughs> but we have one, a copy of it here in the library if you want to look at it, or you're more than welcome to borrow my copy. I do already have it marked. <laughs> so this is 2020. This was the end of 2023 when this came out. I did see if there was a. It's run yes, and I. I have been given funds for 2024 books as well. So that I'm going to wait until mid, the mid year to start buying 2024 books. That's what I did with these. Okay. Yeah, of course. For my people that are recorded this for, uh, I hope it worked. 